Welcome to uh, the second presentation in the series of uh, Friends Faculty Fellowship Talks, uh, sponsored by the Friends of the Dickens Project and presented by the Dickens Project. I am John Jordan. I am the co-director of the Dickens Project, uh, whose headquarters are at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And my co-director, Renee Fox, is unable to be with us today, but she's going to watch the recording of this program uh, when it is done. She's currently at a scholarly conference. Um, I, before I uh, uh, introduce our presenter for today, I want to tell you a few things about the background and the concept of the Friends Faculty Fellowship Talks. Um, first, I want to recognize Courtney Mahaney, who is up at the top. Courtney is the Assistant Director of the Dickens Project. And it was Courtney who first suggested the idea of having a, uh, a program whereby faculty members in the Dickens Project could present pieces of their research, their scholarly research, their academic lives to an audience of the general public. Um, and that was the initial impetus for starting the Friends Faculty Fellowship. Uh, the concept for the Friends Faculty Fellowship is that uh, although it is organized and produced by the Dickens Project, it really is sponsored by the Friends of the Dickens Project. The Friends of the Dickens Project are a group of non-academic, non-specialist uh, members of the general public who uh, have participated over the years in the summer conferences sponsored by the Dickens Project and held in, uh, in Santa Cruz. And uh, the uh, friends of, of the Dickens Project are the, the ones who select the uh, fr faculty fellow for the series that we are, are currently running. Um, and so the friends are both the sponsors and the audience of the Friends Faculty Fellowship. Uh, the, the Friends are uh, interested readers of Dickens, but not necessarily academic specialists. And of course, we welcome scholars and, and lovers of Trollope and lovers of Dickens to today's event. But the real audience for this talk is the general public. You don't have to be a specialist in order to, uh, to, to understand or track what we are talking about today. Um, each of the faculty fellows, friends, faculty fellows, agrees to do three presentations. The first presentation, and today is the first presentation in this particular series, is devoted to the personal research, the scholar's own research on whatever topic they happen to be working on. And uh, the only limitation, the only restriction on that presentation is that they are not allowed to talk about Dickens, um, or at least not to talk primarily about, about, about Dickens. So uh, the first presentation is on the faculty fellows research. And then uh, the second and third presentations, which will take place in, in this case in February and in March, are more like uh, a book club discussion. And the faculty fellow chooses a text, a single Victorian text, not by Dickens, and uh, leads a discussion of that text. Um, and the purpose of this is to allow an opportunity for our audience to participate more fully than they might with a, 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 a regular scholarly lecture or scholarly presentation. So uh, our, our first, our, our, the first uh, presentation will be a more formal one. We will hold questions until uh, Grace has finished her presentation. And 
toward the end, there will be ample time for people to, uh, to ask questions and to participate in the discussion. We'll ask you, we will mute everyone during the talk. And uh, then when you have a question, uh, please use the raised hand function to indicate that you would like to ask it. And then uh, you will need to unmute yourself in order to ask the question. Courtney will help me to track questions. You may also put a question in the chat and we will uh, uh, follow that as well. But uh, Grace is unable to see the, the chat, so she will not be uh, tracking questions in the chat as, as they come up. So having said that, I will now introduce our, our speaker today. Grace Moore first attended the Dickens Project in 1998 as a graduate student at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. Her research looks at Dickens, Trollope, eco-criticism, and fires, among other things. She is the author of Dickens and Empire, which was shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Award for Literary Scholarship in 2006. And she's also the editor, uh, the author of Victorian Novel in Context. She's the editor of Victorian Crime, Madness, and Sensation with Andrew Maunder, Pirates and Mutineers of the 19th Century, and Victorian Environments with Michelle Smith. Her recent publications include an open access special issue entitled Fire Stories, which explores the interconnections between fire and emotion. Grace is at present writing a book about the novelist Anthony Trollope and his representation of environmental change across the globe, while also finishing up another project on settlers and their representation of Australian bushfires. Prior to her arrival at the University of Otago, New Zealand in 2019, Grace taught at the University of Melbourne in Australia for 14 years. She's been a senior research fellow with the Australian Research Council Center of Excellence for the History of Emotions. And she has also taught at the University of Idaho in the United States and the University of Bristol in the UK. So it's my pleasure to turn things over to Grace, who will tell you what she's going to talk about. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Um, and, and thank you everybody for being here, particularly those in Northern California, because I know that the conditions have not been easy for you over the past few days. Um, and, and I've heard that the sun is out, which is wonderful. Um, I have lots of thank yous before I begin. Um, I want to thank the, the Dickens Project and the friends of the Dickens Project um, for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today and um, to engage with you over the next couple of months. I'm very excited to be doing that. Um, and I have a wider thanks also to the Dickens Project. Um, my involvement with the project, as John signaled, began when I was a graduate student and it's been transformative. Um, my career would have followed a very different pathway had I not been involved in the Dickens universe at that early stage. So I really want to register how important it was for me. Um, and I'm very grateful to John, who has been a very generous mentor at different stages of my career um, and has shown characteristic kindness to me. Um, so thank you. Big thanks to Courtney. Um, Courtney Mahaney has just been extraordinary in the way that she has organized everything for this session. Um, she's made sure that I've known everything that I've needed to know. And she was even planning today for power outage contingencies. So she has been absolutely extraordinary and has gone above and beyond what we would expect of somebody organizing an academic session. Um, as John said, uh, I also uh, owe a great debt of gratitude to the ARC Center of Excellence for the History of Emotions, which funded some of the early work I'm going to talk about today. Um, and my present um, program, uh, the English and Linguistics program at the University of Otago have also supported this research. Um, I have several Otago students in the audience, and I just want to say thank you to them for being here. They're on summer holidays, so um, they're showing a great commitment to Victorian studies in being here, um, and I'm very grateful to them for that. 
Um, as John said, I'm going to follow Renee's format um, and I'll give a talk that will kind of try to put together different aspects of my research. Um, when I looked at what I said I would do today, I realized that I'd said I'd do quite a few things. And so I'm going to weave that into a story about the development of my research um, as a way of putting that together and hopefully making sense of it. Um, and I, I can see that there are several um, very eminent Trilopians in the audience, um, and so I hope they'll bear with me. Um, I'm particularly glad to see my dear friend Deborah Morse here. Um, Deborah was the person who switched me on to Trollope in the first place. So thank you, Deborah, for that and for being present as well. Um, we will be reading Harry Heathcote or Harry Heathcote in the next couple of sessions, and. Um, Although there are some print on demand copies available cheaply through big booksellers, um, if you use an independent bookseller, you may find it difficult to get hold of a copy. So Courtney has very kindly made a PDF of the text available. So you can use that um, if you'd like to. Um, and it's a very readable version. Um, I'm now gonna share a screen so that you can see my slides. Um, and we've tested this already, so it should work. Okay, you should now be able to see, you should now be able to see my screen. Um, John, could you please wave to me if you can see my PowerPoint slides? You're the only person I can see now, thank you. Um, so I'm talking to you this morning from Otepote, Dunedin in the South Island of New Zealand. And Anthony Trollope came here in 1872, and he wrote that it was a remarkably handsome town, a town which may be said to be remarkable in every way. Um, I won't say very much about Trollope in New Zealand today, but I did want to flag that there is a connection to the place in which I'm speaking to you. Um, I also should say before I begin that when I talk about a bushfire, it's really roughly equivalent to a Californian wildfire. Um, the landscape and the vegetation are obviously different, but in terms of the scale, um, the scale is, is something that will be familiar to those of you who have known about or even experienced Californian wildfires. Um, the bush is the name that 19th century settlers gave to forest and scrubland areas. When I talk about a bushfire, um, sometimes I'm talking about a fire that's moving through those areas and at other times I'm talking about a fire that's moving through pasture or other land that has been cleared of trees and I'll say more about tree clearance as I move through the talk. So because I said that I would do all of these different things, um, I thought I would begin with a map um, of how everything will hopefully fit together. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about Black Saturday, um, the origins of my project that was on February the 7th, 2009. And then I'll move into the Victorians. Um, John said at the beginning that I was not allowed to talk about Dickens. There will be a little bit of Dickens here. Um, there's a connection to Dickens and household words via William Howitt. Um, and he wrote about Black Thursday and I'll talk a little bit about Black Thursday as a really important bushfire that changed the way the Victorians thought about fire in Australia. Um, I'll introduce you to a couple of early bushfire narratives and their melodramatic properties. And then I'm gonna talk about trauma and emotion and arson. Um, I'll say a little bit about Harry Heathcote. Um, I'm not gonna to say too much because I don't want to spoil it for people who have yet to read. Um, and so I will quote from that text, but I'll only quote from the very beginning. Um, but that will allow me to segue into a discussion of Trollope's travelogue and his time in Australia. Um, the way he connects emotionally to the Australian landscape. Um, and again, it won't matter if you've never picked up Trollope's travelogue. Um, the beauty of Trollope's travel writing is that you can really dip into it and pull out extracts and they just make sense as standalone. So please don't worry if it's an unfamiliar text to you. Um, I'm going to talk about the way that eco-criticism allows me to discuss um, Trollope's representation of an environment that's in transition. And then I'm going to end by saying a little bit about land clearance and fire. 
So I want to begin this talk by, by saying a little bit about the origins of the work. Um, this is something that began to take shape in 2009. Um, at that time, I was living and working in Australia. Um, I'm English originally, and by this point, I'd lived in Australia for about five years. So I was starting to adjust to the climate, although I'm not sure I ever really did. Um, on February the 7th of that year, um, which of course is coincidentally Dickens's birthday, um, the catastrophe that came to be known as Black Saturday, um, the fires of Black Saturday took place across the state of Victoria. On that day, 173 people were killed and thousands of people lost their homes. Um, countless animals died, both native and farm animals and more than 400,000 hectares of land were burned. Um, and this was regarded as uh, one of the worst bushfires in Australian history. And of course that's been superseded by the 2019-2020 the fires. Um, but I'm gonna focus for a little while on the 2009 fires, just to give you a sense of, of where the project came from. So the week of the fires had been extremely hot. Um, there were several days of temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius, uh, which is higher than 104 degrees Fahrenheit, for those of you who work in Fahrenheit. Um, there had been warnings across the state that Saturday was going to be a day of extreme fire danger. And at this time, I was living in suburban Melbourne, um, and the area in which I lived had experienced its own brush with fire about a week before, when some bored teenagers had set fire to some grassland and the fire had spread quickly, and five helicopters were mobilized to, to try to quell the flames. Um, so I'd been thinking about fire before Black Saturday. On the day itself, uh, the temperature rose to 45 degrees or 113. And my abiding memory of my own experiences is one of deep physical discomfort um, until the temperature dropped very suddenly at about six o'clock and the wind shifted direction. Now, a wind change uh, that brings down the temperature in this way is obviously a huge relief from sweltering heat, but it was a catastrophe for those people who were fighting fires in the countryside. Um, the wind change altered the trajectory of the flames um, in an instant, and that can be really dangerous for those people on the front line. And it can also be very dangerous in terms of people's predictions, the calculations people have made about whether they'll stay and try to look after their homes or whether they'll leave. I'd lived in Australia for long enough to understand what this wind change might mean. And so like a number of people in Melbourne, my response to this cool change was a really visceral one. It was a mixture of physical relief combined with alarm. On waking up the next morning, the news was even worse than had been predicted. And as individual stories began to emerge of lives lost, of survivors, and of heroism, I began to think about 19th century settlers in Australia and how they would have responded to fires of this scale. By coincidence, a few days later, I was reading the Tasmanian novelist Richard Flanagan's latest work, Wanting. Um, the novel is mostly about Sir John and Lady Jane Franklin and Martina, the young indigenous Tasmanian girl they adopted and later abandoned. And I was reading primarily because I was doing some research on modern day reworkings of Victorian novels, but also because I knew that Dickens was going to appear as a character in Flanagan's book. But as I read, what struck me most was a really fleeting scene in which Flanagan represented the great bushfires of 1851. And his narrator tells us, the world was hennered by a smoke haze that never ended that brought the sky low and softened every view of the bleak and fantastic hills into something uncertain. The sun was no longer solid and sure, but red and shaking. By day, the air was full of the acrid smell of fire, hundreds of miles distant. By this time, I was in Apollo Bay in southwestern Victoria, and I could see the smoke from the fires that were smoldering on the other side of the harbour. Flanagan's vivid description resonated, and I thought again about early migrants who wouldn't have had the benefit of weather forecasts, high-speed transportation, or modern firefighting equipment, 
they would have to have faced fires, staying to defend their homes with very little knowledge of the enormous conflagra conflagrations they were facing. And for those who lived in remote parts of the bush, there would have been very little assistance. So again, I found myself increasingly curious about what they could do to prepare for fires and what these settlers actually did when the flames attacked. Now, as part of my research for my book on Dickens and Empire, I'd spent a considerable amount of time reading articles about Australia. Um, Dickens commissioned over a hundred, um, and there were lots of pieces in Household Words and all the year round about both Australia and other British colonial holdings. I was reminded that Dickens had commissioned several articles about Australia from William Howitt, um, who lived there briefly between 1852 and 1854. Um, Howitt, like many people, was first drawn across the globe by the gold rush um, and the prospect of, of being able to make a swift fortune. Um, Howitt missed Black Thursday. Um, he didn't witness it at first hand. He arrived a year later. Um, but he wrote an article for Dickens about it, um, and he was an incredibly prolific writer, and he wrote about bushfires in, in several stories for children subsequently. Um, Black Thursday itself was a really calamitous bushfire. Um, it took place on the 6th of February 1851, so you can see the proximity of dates to the 2009 fire. Um, this was massive in scale, 5 million hectares, or a quarter of the state of Victoria were burned that day. Um, official figures suggest that there were only 12 deaths, but in reality the fires were so extreme that it's entirely possible that remote bush dwellers just would have been omitted from these figures because their bodies would never have been found. Um, human remains would have been obliterated by the intensity of the flames. The newspaper, the Melbourne Argus, reported of that day that very many hardworking and persevering settlers have been brought to the verge of ruin. And over a million sheep were killed, um, along with thousands of cattle. For the settler community, Black Thursday was an unprecedented ecological catastrophe of nightmare proportions. As the fire historian Stephen J. Pine expresses it, Black Thursday was the first of the great holocausts that flash across Australian history with the coming of European settlement. All accounts declare that the conflagration was enormous. Now it may sound as though the fires were a terrible shock, um, but in fact there was, as with the 2009 fires, there was a build up to these. Shepherds were reporting um, that there had been blazing on the hillsides for weeks and even months. And an ongoing drought meant that the trees and grass were particularly dry. And when they combined with hot sun and strong wind, fires that had been set by farmers to clear away dead wood um, or campfires set by people out in the bush uh, raged out of control. And this led to burning on a variety of fronts. And as Pine notes, the fires exceeded anything that the colonists had experienced. They were too great for existing knowledge or institutions to absorb. So a real shock. So in the immediate aftermath of these fires, a number of settlers re-evaluated their relationship with the Australian countryside. Um, they had come expecting to find something sort of green and pleasant comparable to the English landscape. And uh, this was the final straw for them. Um, and so some of them moved to the cities. Um, Paul Collins, who is a, a an Australian fire historian, goes so far as to suggest that the events of Black Thursday became a part of the folklore, and he points out that in addition to the trauma of witnessing or escaping from fires, many of the survivors experienced financial ruin, um, the kind of ruin that the Melbourne Argus had warned about. Um, this is, of course, a culture in which there's no household insurance, and so the destruction of homes and equipment and crops and animal food could have really devastating results. You can get a sense of the scale of destruction um, and terror by looking at the picture that Courtney used to publicize this session, um, Black Thursday by William Strutt. This shows the, the chaos and devastation of settlers fleeing the flames. 
Strut shows people on horseback um, and also people with carts, presumably laden with as many of their worldly goods as they could carry away. And we can see discarded possessions, perhaps left by people who've already run ahead. We can see the corpses of farm animals and birds and a couple of kangaroos. Um, some of these animals seem to have been injured, possibly by a previous stampede. We can see people praying and there's a really ghastly red hue to the sky that makes the whole scene look apocalyptic. Um, and having looked from my deck in Otago at the, the skyline from the 2019 fires, I can say that um, this is absolutely accurate in the way it represents just the, the horror of a sky um, when a bushfire is taking place. So it's little wonder that people were still talking about the disaster when Howitt arrived in Australia. Um, and as he kept coming back to it, he kept writing about it several times. It's clearly something that struck an imaginative chord for him. And I think this is just because of the sheer scale of it. Howard wasn't the first person to write a story about a bushfire. Um, Mary Teresa Vidal's novel of 1850, The Cabramatta Store, is probably the first piece of fiction to weave a fire into its plot. Um, there are people who mention bushfires in works before this, but this is really the first sustained plot engagement. Um, it's a novel that makes rather strange reading for the modern reader. Um, there are characters who, who go to the front line, they go to fight the fire, and, and then they stop and they walk away and they have dinner um, and seem to forget about it for a little while. Um, and that's really not very accurate. Um, and it shows that Vidal really didn't have much of a grasp on, on what a bushfire would involve. Um, how it took fire rather more seriously, um, and in fact he wrote two pieces, both entitled Black Thursday. The first was a factual article, and it appeared in Castle's illustrated paper in 1854. Um, and it involves a lot of citations from other sources. Um, because how it hadn't actually been involved in Black Thursday himself, he accumulated a whole range of, of interviews and, and quoted from them quite liberally in this piece. Um, so citing a source that he names only as a writer from Mount Macedon, how it provides his readers with a first-hand account of the devastation, um, which his source believes was caused by a farmer setting fire to dry grass to try to burn it off before the spring. So the farmer says, I write in the midst of desolation. Thursday morning was ushered in with a fierce hot wind, which as the day advanced grew stronger and stronger. For three weeks, bushfires had been raging to the northward and westward of the Bush Inn. About noon, the whole of Mount Macedon and the ranges were one sheet of flame, careering at the speed of a racehorse, carrying all before it as clean as a chimney newly swept. The destruction in the vicinity of the Bush Inn is truly appalling. The article continues to cite a number of similar reflections on the events and drama of the day. I'm sorry, you can hear my dog in the background. I think the mailman has just arrived. What's striking about the survivor stories that how it quotes is how each witness, having carefully documented the hour, shows the fire taking over um, and rupturing conventional experiences of time. Um, something changes when you're involved in a fire. Time works differently. It simultaneously speeds up um, and slows down. And so for this writer, um, quoted by Howitt, the flames rapidly became overwhelming and we see time yielding to the trajectory of the blaze. Um, there's an almost apocalyptic sense of collapse here as a really anxious and fearful anticipation then gives way to devastation. And this was a technique that Howitt was then to draw on in his later fictional version of, of the events. Uh, in a story rather confusingly also entitled Black Thursday, which he wrote for Dickens. So the second fictional Black Thursday tells the story of a young squatter, Robert Patterson, who along with his cattle finds himself caught in a bushfire. And this is a piece that's really remarkable for the emphasis it gives to the strength of settlers, um, people who've laid plans to survive a fire, um, and I think this is one of the reasons it continued to be really popular through the 19th century. Um, the story recycles some of the dramatic content of the 1854 Castles article, 
and how it offers a really graphic account of how the landscape can appear to turn against the settler with the onset of a bushfire. His narrator says, what a scene. The woods were flaming and crackling in one illimitable conflagration. The wind dashing from the north in gusts of inconceivable heat seemed to sear the very face and shrivel up the lungs. The fire leapt from tree to tree, flashing and roaring along with the speed and the destructiveness of lightning. So again, the fire here is completely unstoppable. It's attacking both Patterson and his environment and how it really effectively conveys the drama and terror of this time. While Patterson tries to save his herd, um, because of course represent his livelihood, the speed and the intensity of the fire forces him to abandon them. So having made a calculated decision to sacrifice his livestock in order to stay alive, the character then turns his thoughts to home. And he's learned from experience. Um, he's a sort of model settler in this way because he's made his home ready. He's made it into a kind of sanctuary. Uh, there's then a really dramatic scene where Patterson kind of battles against the heat and the flames and he rides home at a breakneck speed, um, pausing only because he is a hero to save an exhausted man whose horse has died. Um, he then arrives to find his mother safe and sound and this is important to him because his mother's been injured in a previous bushfire and she's unable to walk. So this is a really kind of crucial moment for him. Um, his home has also become a gathering point for neighbours. Um, their properties have been attacked by the fire, so they all converge on his home. Um, and then Robert leaves once more, having assured himself that everybody important to him is safe, um, and takes off to look for some missing neighbours. Um, on the way, he meets a shepherd. Um, he's been dangerously burned, and Robert eventually saves his children too. Um, and then he, he saves them from, from a kind of suffocation in a smouldering sheep hut. Then he encounters a woman named Ellen. Um, he's previously been engaged to Ellen, but there's been a misunderstanding between the two of them. And that's led to a kind of cooling off between them. But at this point, because of the disaster, they put their differences aside and Robert rides off in search of Ellen's missing brother, George. Um, and that putting the differences aside is a really important part of bushfire stories as we move through the 19th century. Um, they become very much about building um, an Australian national identity, a kind of collective identity in the face of the fire as a kind of adversary. So I think with the, um, the Howitt story, everybody can probably predict what happens next. Um, Robert um, acquits himself honorably and um, is able to, to save um, Ellen's brother. And that of course brings them back together. In bringing the story to a conclusion, how it emphasizes the immensity of the fires. Um, he notes that across a space of 300 by 150 miles, flocks and herds in thousands had perished. Houses, ricks, fences, and bridges had been annihilated whole families had been destroyed. Um, but what's interesting about Howitt is that in spite of this apocalyptic vision, he's also able to kind of look forward. He anticipates the renewal that follows fire damage. Um, he points to what he calls kindly autumn rains as a symbol of hope and rebirth. Theonola Morgan, who has recently published a collection of 19th century fire stories, has commented that for today's reader, Howitt's Black Thursday displays many of the characteristics routinely associated with cultural narratives of bushfires, heroism in the moment and community spirit in the aftermath, the successful defense of the settler home and the dissolution of class tension and division in the face of disaster. Howard's story is also important because it had a long afterlife. Um, it was woven into an adventure serial by another author in 1894, and it was republished in a Brisbane newspaper in 1896. And that's rather curious. Um, you know, it's a great story. It's an interesting story, but it's not a fantastic story. Um, it may be that it continued to be topical because there were serious bushfires in the 1890s. Um, it could also be that the story's combination of romance and danger simply continued to appeal to the Victorian appetite for sensation. It's, it's hard to say. 
So having written about how its story in a book chapter, I began to realize that there might be a bigger project here. And I started to gather stories and poems and novels and newspaper articles about bushfires. And these are works of varying quality. Um, they were written for lots of different reasons. Some of them are even funny in tone, um, just because of the sort of historical distance um, and the, the, the melodrama that, that punctuates the way that some of the authors write. Many writers were drawn to bushfires as spectacular and exotic events that would go down well with a readership back in England. Uh, but then, as now, people also wrote about fires as a way of coping with the trauma that natural disasters evoke, um, and also as a medium for exploring their very mixed emotions in relation to the Australian landscape um, and its extreme difference to the world that they'd left behind. So writing about fire could be a kind of therapy for survivors, and it's not at all unusual to find really personal handwritten references Re reflections or poems dealing with fires um, amongst collections of family papers in libraries in both Australia and New Zealand. Um, and they're quite moving things to come across. This kind of writing is very interesting for its emotional content and what it reveals about settler fears. But what's also fascinating to me is the number of visitors to Australia who chose to write about bushfires. In addition to the different literary figures I'm discussing today, other writers who traveled to Australia and who subsequently wrote about fires include Henry Kingsley, Charles Kingsley's brother, and also H.G. Wells. Um, H.G. Wells, of course, memorably wrote about fire in The Time Machine in 1895, but he lived long enough to witness at first hand the Black Friday fires in Victoria in 1839. Uh, sorry, in 1939, um, so into the 20th century. In the early stages of my research, I thought about the work that I was doing as um, a literary historical project. Um, some of the pieces that I was examining had been lost because of the ephemerality of newspaper and magazine serialization. And of course, over the time that I've been doing this project, over the time that I've been working with periodicals, digitization has really revolutionized the way that we can do this kind of work. Um, it's so much easier today to find these things through searching key terms. Um, and with the help of Helen Hickey, who did some research assistance for me, I soon had a really huge collection of materials. As I worked through them, I was really intrigued by the emotional content, um, and I began to try to trace developments and commonalities. And one element that I found particularly interesting was how the first responses to Black Thursday were largely melodramatic and almost formulaic at times. Um, there were quite a few Christmas stories that featured bushfires, um, and there was even one that was modeled on Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Um, there are three ghosts and there's a bushfire. <laughs> it's a very strange piece of writing. But I think these kinds of works are the result of settlers trying to reimagine the, the festive season in extreme temperatures. A number of these early bushfire stories involve dramatic rescues by horses. And there are several works, including Ellen Clacey's short story, A Bushfire of 1854, where, as with Howitt's story, the fire becomes a means of bringing romantic resolution to a plot in which the characters are socially divided. And so I think what happens is that the heroics surrounding a thrilling bushfire rescue would allow class boundaries to be relaxed. This brought together couples who would be regarded as really unsuitable for each other back in England, um, and heroics kind of effaced the differences between them. We can see slightly haughty heroines uh, who can only marry rugged free settlers once they've demonstrated their ability to preserve the woman from the terrors that the Australian landscape throws up. As the fire writing genre developed um, and as settlers and writer visitors came to learn more about the Australian climate and to understand more about the cyclical nature of fire, understanding that fire comes back, um, romance and melodrama began to give way to much more serious concerns. Some of the late 19th century stories 
dealing with fire, explore what we today term post-traumatic stress disorders that were triggered by bushfires. And there are some truly haunting stories that begin, that begin to appear from the 1870s onwards and engage with physical and psychological injuries. One of the most memorable is J.S. Borlase's 12 Miles Broad. Um, and this involves an arson plot and a rescue that's only partially successful. It's a rescue that leaves the narrator's wife unable to remain in their home. Um, the view of the, the charred hills outside combined with her knowledge that fire is seasonal is something that becomes too much for her. Um, arson has sort of motivated this plot. Um, a, a stranger emerges from the bush um, and sets fire to, to the farm. And as a result, uh, we then see uh, a kind of a, a rescue story that speaks back to the early tales um, in that it involves a dramatic flight by horse. But on this occasion, the horse is actually not, um, there, there are not enough horses to go around. And so the woman's father then decides that he'll sacrifice his life. And so she's hugely, hugely traumatized as a result. Now, arson, as it is today, um, was a huge threat in, um, in the 19th century, uh, particularly when it was combined with arid conditions. And so it soon became very much a focus for bushfire stories. And it was while I was doing some work for a piece on deliberate fire setting that this project took another turn. Um, Deborah Morse um, told me that I should take a look at Anthony Trollope's novella, Harry Heathcote of Gangoyle, which was originally published in the Christmas edition of the graphic. So this is one of those um, Christmas stories that is trying to make sense of Christmas in the sunshine. Um, it appeared in December eight, 1873 um, as part of the Christmas number of that, um, that work, that periodical. So I'm going to follow Renee's lead here and not say too much about Harry Heathcote. Um, I'm only going to quote from the very beginning of the text. Um, and then I'm going to think a little bit more about Trollope's Antipodean travelogue, Australia and New Zealand. And that I hope will give you a sense um, of how Trollope engaged with Australia. And it'll also give you a sense of the landscape um, that he depicts in the novel when you get to it. Um, I will say now that I was struck immediately by how vividly Trollope, um, whom I'd thought of until this point as a quintessentially English writer, described the Australian heat, described the landscape, and really was able to convey the threat that a fire could pose to farmers. I don't think I'm spoiling anything when I say that Harry Heathcote is a work that is concerned with settler anxieties relating to fire. And those very deep concerns are what gives the narrative its momentum. Uh, John Shawble, who is himself a firefighter, has noted in his article Lost in Flames, the great missing Australian bushfire novel, that when it came to novels, bushfires tended to play an episodic role. Um, they tended to be, uh, they, they were seldom a, a central element of plots because they pass through an area so quickly. It's very hard to maintain suspense and drama um, and narrative interest in something that happens so, so fleetingly. Harry Heathcote's distinct for its time because Trollope combines his depiction of the fire with a focus on Harry's psychology and the character's nervous anticipation that sooner or later his farm's going to be engulfed in flames. And again, this is a concern that we see from the very onset, so I'm not giving you any spoilers here. The Canadian affect theorist Brian Masumi has written a really fascinating essay about how survivors of traumatic events often anticipate future disasters, um, as well as reliving the event that's caused their trauma. And the character Harry follows this pattern. Having lost his home once through being orphaned and then emigrating, he absolutely dreads losing it a second time to fire. And so this is what gives the narrative a lot of its impetus. Uh, impetus. There's a huge emphasis on Harry's psychology. The 19th century settlers, farming in the bush often involved an ongoing and emotional struggle against the sprawling indigenous plant life. Harry Heathcote's farm at Gangoyle is divided into paddocks that differ from those on an English farm only in terms of their scale. Um, 
And this arrangement points to a problem that the text doesn't really address with importing European farming techniques to a very different climate. Um, Trollope's very aware of the intense labor that's required to create an English style farm on the other side of the, of the world. Um, he registers the, the role of land clearance, um, what we today term deforestation. And he also outlines some of the challenges associated with setting up home in, in what was effectively a wilderness. So this is from the very beginning of the novel. Gengoyle was decidedly in the bush, according to common Australian parlance. All sheep stations are in the bush, even though there should not be a tree or shrub within sight. There are Australian pastures which consist of plains on which not a tree is to be seen for miles, but others are forests so far extending that their limits are almost unknown. Gangoyle was surrounded by forest, in some places so close to be impervious to men and almost to animals, in which the undergrowth was thick and tortuous and almost plaited through, which no path could be made without an axe, but of which the greater proportions were open without any underwood, between which the sheep could wander at their will, and men could ride with a sparse surface of coarse grass, which after rain would be luxuriant, but in hot weather could be scorched down to the ground. Now in this passage, um, Trollope immediately shows his English readers the hostility of the climate. He signals already the danger um, of the fire that's going to plague Harry for most of the narrative. Um, he also highlights the damage that Europeans are inflicting upon the landscape. He notes here the, the axes that are being used in the undergrowth and other more serious forms of ecological vandalism, including the practice of ring barking. Um, and this is a technique that involves cutting a circle into a tree trunk um, and stopping its supply of sap so that it sort of dies and keels over. Um, this was a, a widely used technique for clearing land efficiently, and it's one of which Trollope and, and many other writers were highly critical. Um, I won't say any more about the plot now, but while I was writing about arson, I kept coming back to Trollope's landscapes. They stayed with me. And slowly I realized that I was becoming increasingly interested in the environments that I was reading and writing about. And I also realized that I needed to start to bring much more eco-critical theory into my work. Now, when I talk about eco-criticism, I'm talking broadly about an approach that enables the study of the representation of the environment in literature and culture. Um, as the eco-critic and nature writer Richard Kerridge puts it, the eco-critic wants to track environmental ideas and representations wherever they appear, to see more clearly a debate which seems to be taking place, often part concealed, in a great many cultural spaces. Most of all, eco-criticism seeks to evaluate texts and ideas in terms of their coherence and usefulness as responses to environmental crisis. I think this is a really helpful definition. Um, early eco-criticism was um, mostly concerned with nature writing, but it's become much more capacious in recent years and the discipline has broadened to, to think about all kinds of environments. So as an example, um, pollution as we experience it today is something that we might identify as a 19th century phenomenon, um, something that's tied to the rise of factories with the shift to industrial manufacturing. So we could look at a text like Elizabeth Gaskell's North and South. Um, we could see signs of pollution that she recorded almost incidentally as part of her plot. She has characters um, who experience disease um, and discomfort because of smoke in the atmosphere. She has one character who actually drowns in um, a purple river, which has been contaminated by dyes released from the factories. And we might say the same of the fog that pervades Bleak House. Um, yes, on the one hand, it has a really important symbolic role to play in that novel, but it also represents the physical contamination that extended through a 19th century cityscape. And eco-criticism allows us to think about these things. Um, it's a way for literary studies, not only to respond to the era of climate change, but also to look back on how industrialism or in Trollope's case, industrialized farming, has altered the world over the last 200 years or so. Uh, we can also use the approach to look at texts from the past which show points of origin for today's climate crises. 
um, and there are lots of different approaches to eco-criticism eco and the environmental humanities. I can say more about that in Q&A if people are interested, um, but it's a huge, huge discipline and I work in a tiny, tiny corner of it. So in my own work, I've brought emotions theory and eco-criticism together, largely because um, I think everybody here would say the environment is such an emotional subject. Um, you know, we have, we, we feel emotional about the weather and weather events. Uh, we feel emotional about the very different things that climate change is throwing up at us. But in Trollope's writing, um, these two things, emotions and environment, are inextricably entwined. Um, this is hardly a surprise as a novelist. Um, he's a very astute recorder of people's emotions, of characters' emotions. Um, and so it's hardly surprising that this is something that comes across in his travel writing as well. Now, I think my second big realization was that I wasn't just writing a book about bushfires. Um, I was in fact writing two books, which is something I don't recommend. Um, and, so I was writing the book that I'd been writing all along, the one about bushfires, but a second project had begun to emerge on Trollope and the environment. And that prompted me to try to learn more about Trollope's first-hand experiences in Australia. It's these that really inform his, his landscapes in Harry Heathcote. So Trollope had traveled extensively through the British Empire because of his work for the post office. Um, but twice he made the journey to Australia in the 1870s, um, this time as a kind of tourist. He took one long trip with his wife Rose in 1871 to two to visit their younger son Frederick. And they spent 18 months in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and you can see here the SS Great Britain, um, a ship that today is actually harbored in Bristol. Um, the, the Trollops took this, uh, this ship to the steamship to Australia, and it took them a couple of months to, to voyage there. Um, the second trip that um, Trollop took was um, to again to visit his son Fred. Fred owned a sheep station in New South Wales. Um, Trollope had purchased this sheep station for him outright, um, and then he continued to subsidize it for, for some time. Uh, poor Fred didn't have much luck with his farm, and the second trip to Australia in 1875, which this time Trollope took alone, was to try to help Fred wind up his business um, and to sell the farm. Trollope wrote in his autobiography, I went to Australia chiefly in order that I might see my son among his sheep. I did see him among his sheep and remained with him for four or five very happy weeks. He was not making money, nor has he made money since. I grieve to say that several thousands of pounds which I had squeezed out of the pockets of perhaps two liberal publishers have been lost on the venture. But I rejoice to say that this has been in no way due to any fault of his. I never knew a man work with more persistent honesty at his trade than he has done. Writing to a friend during his stay, Trollope emphasized how hard his son was working and expressed real admiration for his efforts. Fred, my son here, is always on horseback and seems to me to have more troubles on his back than any human being I ever came across. Later, when the station failed, Trollope was eager to make it known that it was not for lack of hard work on Fred's part. He was, Trollope was sympathetic to the trials of the farmer and he understood that determination alone wasn't enough in a hostile and drought ridden land. Now, as part of this first trip, which was funded largely by his publishers Chapman and Hall, Trollope also traveled to New Zealand in the winter of 1872. Uh, he arrived here in August and he undertook a whistle stop tour of the colony before going back to Australia. Um, and I think the speed with which he traveled through New Zealand um, really makes his account um, much less um, immersive in terms of the ecology of the place. Trollope was paid an advance of £1,250, so a sizable sum for the travelogue, um, and he based this work on a series of articles he wrote for the Daily Telegraph as he travelled. To Trollope's great surprise, Australia and New Zealand became a bestseller. Uh, by this point in his career, he was a well-known travel writer, but what makes Australia and New Zealand stand apart from his other writings in the genre is that he also viewed the book as a kind of guide for would-be migrants, and there was an enormous market for these kinds of books. 
Um, somewhere between 80 and 100 works about Australia were published between 1840 and 1873. So you can imagine that a book by a best-selling author like Trollope on this subject would have been really appealing to potential migrants. When Australia and New Zealand appeared in book form in 1873, um, it was largely unrevised from the newspaper articles. Uh, the fact that Trollope didn't edit his writing extensively often resulted in inconsistencies, and that can make it very hard to pin him down to a single position. And I have a PhD student I share with Professor Deidre Coleman at the University of Melbourne, Gatang, and she's working on a dissertation that's nearly finished on Trollope and race and emotion. And one of the things that she looks at is the way that the speed with which Trollope wrote often problematized his depictions of race. Um, so speed is kind of, it's, it's a difficulty with Trollope's writing. And you can see from this cartoon on the left, from Melbourne Punch in 1873, that some of the first readers of, the first Australian readers of Trollope's travelogue were critical of the speed with which he wrote. Um, you probably can't see it, but the caption below the image of the writer astride a hurtling steam engine reads, the good St. Anthony kept his eyes fixed firmly upon his book. The way that very fast writer, Mr. Trollope, collected the information that enabled him to brand our girls, Regans and Gonorils. Now, this cartoon is referring specifically to some of Trollope's comments about Australian women, but I think it also captures a broader impatience with his hasty and at times uncritical recording of events. And it also shows a shift from the very warm welcome that Punch had extended to Trollope on his arrival in Australia, as we can see in the earlier image on the right from August 1871. We can see Mr. Punch and his dog Toby greeting the author warmly. Um, and there were also a large number of poems, not just in Melbourne Punch, but elsewhere, that um, really sort of celebrated Trollope's arrival in Australia. Nigel Stark, in his really wonderful examination of Trollope's time down under, describes the 56-year-old writer's plans as involving what he calls a rigorous schedule of exploration. And Stark highlights the exhaustive and exhausting nature of his tour. He says over 12 months and two days, Trollope would ride into the loneliness of the bush, travel to and through all six colonies by steamship and steam train and stagecoach, descend mines, explore caves, tour asylums, invade an opium den, give evidence to a parliamentary committee, hunt kangaroos and interview convicts. He would even sleep on the ground, do without washing and eat nastiness out of a box when covering 280 mile, miles by mail cart on the track between Albany and Perth, Western Australia in March 1872. Um, the only other person I know who would possibly follow this kind of itinerary is Dickens. This is a very Dickensian approach, I think, to Australia. It's clearly the itinerary of a writer who wants to see and experience as much as he possibly can. Um, and this is a trait that Francesca Oristano traces back to Dickens and what she describes as the fundamental rule of travel writing, that the author has to provide novelty. As Oristano points out, Dickens wrote of his perplexingly divided and subdivided duty in the matter of the books of travels, with reference to American notes. And she observes that Trollope also writes of a duty to his readers and to telling the truth when he follows Dickens's footsteps through North America in 1862. And of course, I should add here that Dickens was, as many of you know, himself influenced by Trollope's own mother, Frances, and her domestic Manners of the Americans, which was published in 1832. So travel writing was a kind of constantly developing genre, with travellers almost kind of trying to one up each other with each voyage and, and account of the voyages. If we look back to Dickens's American Notes from 1842, we can find a melancholy description of a cleared landscape, which he recorded as he traveled to Cincinnati. And I think this scene is interesting because for me, it anticipates Trollope's really attentive accounts of settlers and flora and fauna in Australia. Dickens writes, for miles and miles and miles, these solitudes are unbroken by any sign of human life or trace of human footstep. 
nor is anything seen to move about them but the blue jay, whose colour is so bright and yet so delicate that it looks like a flying flower. At lengthened intervals, a log cabin, with its little space of cleared land about it, nestles under a rising ground and sends its thread of blue smoke curling up into the sky. It stands in the corner of the poor field of wheat, which is full of great unsightly stumps, like earthy, earthly butcher's blocks. Sometimes the ground is only just now cleared, the felled trees lying yet upon the soil, and the log house only this morning begun. As we pass this clearing, the settler leans upon his axe or hammer and looks wistfully at the people from the world. And still, there is the same eternal foreground. The river has washed away its banks, and stately trees have fallen down into the stream. Some have been there so long that they're mere dry, grisly skeletons. Some have just toppled over, and having earth yet about their roots, are bathing their green heads in the river and putting forth new shoots and branches. Some are almost sliding down as you look at them, and some were drowned so long ago that their bleached arms start out from the middle of the current and seem to try to grasp the boat and drag it underwater. Now, the Australian vista is very different from that of America, but there are some interesting parallels, I think, between the tone here and that of Trollope's travel writing. They share, I think, the same brooding quality. In this passage from Dickens, the American settles clearly isolated, just like the Australian farmer. I think a difference here is that Dickens is describing both the work of the settler and his acts and that of nature through a combination of the recently felled trees and those that are toppled and sliding, having fallen long ago. Um, and there's a really languid, decadent quality to those trees that I think is just beautiful. Dickens here is showing the land's long history, uh, but Trollope's writing from 30 years later show a much relentless, a much more relentless persecution of the natural world. Uh, but what I love is that Trollope shares Dickens's American vision of the dead trees as skeletons, something littering the landscape. And that's an image he imports into both Harry Hefkert and his accounts of traveling through Australian forests as well. It was traveling in Australia that enabled Trollope to capture the landscape so vividly in Harry Hefkert. And as Trollope admitted, the character of Harry is, is very much based on Trollope's own son, Fred, and his sheep farm, Mortray. Uh, Trollope tried to create a little bit of distance by relocating the action from New South Wales to Queensland um, to try to avoid obvious parallels. Um, and one of the things I've been trying to think through is how that would have changed the way a fire worked. Um, the vegetation in Queensland would have been significantly different from that in New South Wales, uh, which Trollope would definitely have known having traveled through both spaces. One of the interesting things about Trollope's travel writing is that desire that we see in Dickens, the desire to set down everything that was different and new um, in meticulous detail. And this is a real gift for eco-critical writing because like many 19th century realist writers, Trollope recorded a whole host of radical environmental changes. But there's something else going on here too, I think. Um, because Trollope's son had settled in Australia, the process of scrutinizing the landscape was very different from I think anywhere else he traveled. It was rooted in emotion. He was thinking about Fred and the problems that the climate was posing to him. Um, he was thinking about Fred's success or in fact failure as a farmer. So Trollope was deeply interested in all the things that made Australia different, the privations of settler life, the problems that the parched ground posed for, for people who wanted to work in agriculture. And he was writing of Fred's new home. So there's a deeply, deeply sentimental, emotional or affective connection going on here. Trollope didn't always understand the long-term implications of what he was describing, but the accounts in his travelogue and the fiction informed by his travels are incredibly valuable as source materials. Um, for example, he wrote about the, the impact of imported farm animals upon native flora and fauna in Australia and New Zealand. Um, he also gives accounts of outdoor pursuits like dingo hunting, which offer really fascinating insights into settler attitudes towards animals and acclimatization and environmental change. Um, one of the things I've done is to write about Trollope hunting a dingo, um, which on the one hand should be a really sort of comic affair. Trollope um, 
describes people confronted with, with fences that are too tall because they've been built to keep out kangaroos um, instead of keeping cattle and sheep in as they would be in an English context. Um, and all of the horses just go crashing into the fences because they're not accustomed to the height of them. Um, and so this should be a comic moment, but for Trollope, it's actually a deeply disturbing one. And for me as a modern day reader, you know, the activity of actually hunting the dingo is also something quite horrendous. And so there are a whole host of emotions kind of coalescing around this scene. In addition, Trollope wrote about mining um, in his 1879 novel, John Caldergate, um, which is partially set in the Australian gold diggings. And in this work, he, he revealed the absolutely horrific destruction that had been left behind by gold prospectors. And this is something that he would have witnessed as he moved through the gold fields of Victoria. Um, and I have a chapter on mining in the book that I'm writing. Interestingly, in his lifetime, Trollope seems to have been respected as a nature writer. Um, and so seriously did the Victorians consider the interplay between his travelogues and his understandings of the environment that Trollope's later work, South Africa from 1878, was reviewed in the scientific journal Nature um, with the reviewer WLJ, noting in particular his interest in irrigation and its significance for mining communities, um, along again with the, pro the, the problems that were posed by parched landscapes for imported European plant life. More recent critics have been rather less sensitive to Trollope's ecological awareness. Um, his biographer, Victoria Glendinning, has commented that he knew nothing about plants and grew bored when being conducted around botanical gardens. And she cites the, the novelist's impatience with the need to recall the Latin names of, of plants to try to support this, this assertion about him. Um, I think he may have found the botanical order um, of the gardens, of the, the carefully laid out garden to be tiresome. But his travelogues suggest that he felt quite differently about the unfamiliar plants and trees that he encountered in Australia, um, some of which had a real wow factor for him. There are other scenes where he's like, he's kind of moving through forests um, and he does get bored at that point. Um, I think Trollope has quite a low boredom threshold. Um, but um, there are times when it's clear that the, the foliage has made a deep, deep impression upon him. And he's really interested in how different it is. And I think that also explains why he's a little bit dismissive about the New Zealand landscape, because he just thought that it was a little bit too European looking when combined, when, when contrasted with the huge difference of Australia. So taking an environmental humanities approach to Trollope was transformative for me. Um, I'm definitely not a high theorist, but eco-criticism has allowed me to engage not only with Trollope's representations of fire, but also with his wider account of an environment that is changing remarkably rapidly. As I said a short time ago, cleared landscapes like fields for sheep and cattle burn very quickly. And Trollope chronicled that clearance process through his travel writing. Fire setting in 19th century writer had become entangled um, with lots of settler anxieties about the people they persecuted and displaced from the land. And fire setting was used by settlers um, as a way of moving people off land and also of moving trees away from the land. Over time, settler stories came to encompass a broad range of these concerns. Um, Trollope encapsulates this convergence of guilt driven fears in Australia and New Zealand when he asks, how are the inhabitants to make themselves safe against black savages, against convicts who were still more savage and against fire? Um, I'm not gonna put that on a slide because I think um, you know, it's a problematic pronouncement. Um, but what happens here is um, that Trollope is, is drawing on what he's learned from settlers he's talked to about indigenous Australians and their relationship with fire um, often people didn't understand that Indigenous Australians were setting fires to try to manage the land as they had done over generations, um, and they did this as a way of controlling the way the land burns. And so people mistook what was actually custodianship for an act of arson, and in a number of bushfire stories you'll see plots where settlers express anxiety about Indigenous Australians setting fires, and this is where this comes from.
As you can see from that comment, um, in spite of his best efforts, Trollope frequently interwove issues of race, land ownership, and anticipated extinction. Um, and while in his previous travelogues, he'd, he'd really not spent much time thinking and, and writing about race, it really stayed with him in relation to the Australian trip. He wrote about it again in a sequence of letters um, to the Liverpool Mercury that he worked on during his second trip to Australia in 1875. Um, these were later published as The Tireless Traveller. And I think, again, this all comes back to Fred. Um, as a sheep farmer, he was directly implicated in a system that viewed both trees and human lives as inconveniences to be pushed off the land. And that didn't sit completely easily with Trollope's conscience. In Australia and New Zealand, as in Harry Heathcote, Trollope writes of land being cleared through ring barking, describing that process and noting some of the itinerant characters who wandered from the farm, from farm to farm, killing trees so that land could be cleared for livestock. Um, and you'll see that he really doesn't approve of these kinds of people. In a discussion of native animals, he says of the possum, and this is the charismatic Australian possum, not the, um, the slightly terrifying North American possum. He says of the possum that the hollow, half-dead, crumbling gum trees are full of him. And here he casually references the kind of carnage, the destruction that was being inflicted on the landscape to remove tree coverage for grazing. Several chapters later, when he returns to the matter, he's describing a, a number of road making projects. Um, and according to his figures, which he collected completely obsessively, more than 604 miles of road had com been completed by the time he traveled to Australia with another 1,255 in various states of completion. And as he concludes his thoughts about the roads, he continues to think about the land that's been cleared to make them and the impact that this has had upon the forests that remain. And he says, this traveling through the endless forest of gum trees is very peculiar and at first attractive. After a while, it becomes monotonous in the extreme. There is a great absence of animal life. One may go on all day. One may go all day through a pastoral country without seeing a sheep or a kangaroo. Now and again, one hears the melancholy note of the magpie or the unmelodious but cheerful gobble of the laughing jackass and sometimes the scream of the cockatoo. But even birds are not common. This passage reminds me of the extract from American Notes that I read a little while ago. It's notable for what's there, for, for, sorry, it's notable for what isn't there as much as what is. And the scene that I'm quoting continues for some time with Trollope reflecting on his occasional meetings with swagmen and squatters who appear very suddenly out of the bush. Um, strikingly absent from this scene are indigenous Australians. And there's a really uncanny quality to this empty forest that I think gives it almost Gothic haunting properties. Um, and to try to give you a sense of what I mean, um, here's an image from Percy Spence. It's a 20th century image, um, but it really beautifully conveys um, the, the Gothic qualities of a forest that's been ring barked. Um, you can see the rings around the trees and is dying. Um, and there's some moonlight here just to add a sense of atmosphere as well. So the Australian critics Jean-Francois Vernet and Nathaniel O'Reilly have noted that the landscape in Australia can seem almost unnerving when it's represented as empty. And this discomforting quality, they argue, stems from the knowledge um, that settler society is repressing and refusing to confront, the knowledge that the land isn't actually empty or vacant at, or at all. It's been stolen from Indigenous Australians. And so with that, repress knowledge at the back of their minds, the cries of native animals and birds take on very eerie characteristics. And it's an eeriness that's symbolic and real at the same time. Um, I find the sound of a kookaburra cackling to be utterly, utterly terrifying. Um, but in 19th century settler stories and in Trollope's writing, um, it often has um, a, a, an added layer of importance um, in that it's signaling a real discomfort with the land. So these noises often provoke disproportionate expressions of fear, and I think that fear stems from concerns about people who might suddenly appear in the bush. That's something we'll see in Harry Heathcote. Um, 
Trollope's assertions of emptiness and melancholy here borrow from this settler aesthetic, but they also convey a deeper and more lasting silence in the name of progress. You know, the trees are being killed, the animals are being killed. There are many casualties associated with farming in Australia. Um, the people and the native animals who are being displaced from their traditional homes and endangered as a consequence. And as I've written about in, in several pieces, Trollope often uses discussions of Australian animals and their potential extinction to veil a discussion of the traditional inhabitants and their annihilation. Um, he even uses the phrase, we keep down our remorse to kind of signal that he's, he's veiling these things. So Trollope's environmental writings don't always stand the test of time but they offer really fascinating insights into how a prominent traveller saw the changes that colonialism was enforcing upon the land. Whether he knew it or not, and he probably didn't, Trollope was mapping climate change and his observations really resonate for the 21st century readers in ways that I think are sometimes spine tingling um, and deeply effective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grace. This was fascinating, wonderful, and uh, an excellent preparation for our discussions of Harry Heathcote. Um, so we have ample time for questions. I hope that people will use the raised hand function um, or put a question if you have it in the chat. I see that we already have some comments in the chat. Uh, or just raise your physical hand and we will call on you. So um, I invite people to uh, respond. And uh, um, Deborah, why don't you begin? Lead us off with a good question. Um, that was just a wonderful talk, Grace, um, from which I learned so much. Um, you know, for, for years and years, I think, we all, or most most people concentrated on the sort of social trollop, the urban trollop, the, if it was rural, that was Barsetshire. All right, so um, to think about him in relation to Australian landscape, um, it, for me, was absolutely fascinating. Um, well, my question really has to do with one of the things you brought up about bushfires, um, bringing up a kind of amelioration of class tension mm. uh, or kind of abrogation of, of class tension um, from some of the things that you'd read and talked about. I, that was, uh, I, I, had, had, I had noticed that. And um, I'm really thinking about that in connection with the creation of national identity. And just wanted to bring up a, a couple of things about Trollope that I'm really curious about what you, what you might think about um, how these elements inflect um, the amelioration of class tension in relation to the um, creation of Australian national identity. And that is, I was thinking about how Trollope was actually writing Lady Anna, which is mm -hmm. such a sort of cross-class um, um, uh, romance um, as weird as it is, right? As he was going to Australia, I mean, on shipboard. And so how he was really thinking or, or perhaps, you know, imagining what, um, you know, what that um, sort of erasure of class tension might be like. I mean, he was thinking about it as he's going over. But then also I was thinking about how Fred really at least in the views of view of, of Rose Hazeltine, the uh, Trollope's wife, had really married down. Yeah, you know? I'm always a big fan of hers, Susanna's. You know, <laughs> you know, but she and of course she had all those kids. I mean, it seemed like a really <laughs> happy marriage. You know, eight kids, right? Um, but you know, I'm just thinking how. You know, I'm sorry. This is more a sort of set of observations and sort of you know notes rather than really a, a question, but I guess ultimately it has to do with, um, you know, sort of somehow putting together 
you know, that amelioration of class tension in relation to Australian national identity and, you know, what that might in fact have to do with um, the urgency of bushfire trauma. Mm. Yeah. And, and so I guess that that's my question, if it's enough of a question, Grace, and tell me if it's not. <laughs> um, I'll try to answer the, the different bits of it. And so pick me up if I leave, leave anything behind. Um, it's a fabulous a question. Um, and um, yes, you're absolutely right that, that Rose was not entirely nice to Susanna um, mm. and, and really felt that Fred could have done better. Um, I think uh, Trollope, of course, was much more charmed by her. Um, <laughs> but I think Trollope, when he was, you know, he was traveling to Australia, having done a massive amount of preparation, he'd read a lot, an awful lot of background material um, about Australia. And so I think it makes sense, as you say, that he's kind of thinking about effacing class barriers as he's preparing to travel there. Um, and um, you know, it's, it's certainly on his mind. Um, I think when he gets to Australia, he's kind of challenged by what he finds and, and that inconsistency that I was talking about that comes from writing so swiftly really comes into play. There are times when, you know, he can, he is quite challenged by some of the things that Australian women in particular do um, and the way that they kind of deport themselves. Uh, like a lot of visitors to Australia, he's, he's a little bit shocked by the way servants behave. Um, although interesting, Trollope's own cook actually ended up staying in Australia because she met, um, she met a farmer and married him. And so she ended up having a very different life than she'd expected. Um, and that's another nice parallel with the Dickenses. Dickens lost his cook when he was in Italy because she got married to an Italian. So I I think the moral of the story is don't take your cook overseas with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of the way that a bushfire effaces class boundaries um, and the way that that feeds into a nation building narrative, um, it's something that Trollope is exploring in Harry Hithcote through characters who clearly loathe each other at the beginning, but join together to fight the fire. And I think, you know, he's very much thinking about Australia as not a place that you visit briefly to make your fortune, even though that's what he did. You know, when he thinks about Fred in Australia, he's thinking about this as a long-term venture. And, and Fred did spend, you know, he, he lived out his life in Australia. Um, and so if you're going to settle in a place, you have to commit to kind of making it. Um, and Australian culture was made up of these incredibly diverse migrant communities. And so there is a sense in which old class ties or class boundaries have to be left behind. Um, and there has to be some sort of respect for people who are making their living on farms um, or on the gold, in the gold rush um, and those kinds of things. Does that answer the different threads of your question, Deborah? Uh, no, thank you so much. I should add that Deborah is actually responsible for this talk today. Um, she asked me um, about eight years ago to write a piece on Trollope and Australian ecology. And I didn't have the heart to tell her that I didn't know anything about it. It seemed much easier to, to find out about it than to admit that I didn't know. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. It's wonderful. <laughs> Ellen. Okay, um, just to introduce myself a little bit. I have published a paper on um, in Antipodes, Trollope's, on, Trollope, on Inventing a New Country, Trollope's uh, Depiction of Settler Colonialism. And I'm very interested in this kind of thing. And one of the things that I'm interested in is not just Australia, but when Trollope went to Canada. Mm. Uh, to get to my idea, I'm struck by how you mentioned this, that the landscape attacks people. We're used to modern ideas of secularism, the, that the landscape is indifferent to human beings. But in returning home, it positively swallows her. Uh, and, and just uh, that's why I'm going to mention these others. Uh, Margaret Atwood's survival. She says that the way the Canadian identity is plagued is that you have this Canadian fierce climate that's going to destroy you. Uh, or that one by Lindsay, whose name I can't remember. Peter Weir made a movie where these people go through this landscape and they're in a high rock and they die mysteriously. Do you know the name? Um, and so I. Um, that's power, uh, what I'm getting at is how much is the power of uh, Harry Keithcote come from this idea of the fire, it's of the landscape itself wanting to attack you 
Um, my other, I, is that, is, is it because England has been there so long? Oh yeah, picnic and hanging rock, thank you. Of course, um, yeah. That England has been there so long that they've already forgotten what it was like in the 10th or 8th century when they were trying to make England more livable. And so by the time of the 19th century, they think, oh, well, how livable it is. Um, and I think that's part of one of the uh, appeals of Trollope's depiction, because I've read other Australian authors. But he comes back to this again and again. And it's very modern. Think of the proposition, the movie, The Proposition, that the landscape is attacking you and you have to deal with this landscape. It's it's um, it's very Trollopian somehow to me. Uh, and it does escape this usual social entanglement to look at man against the landscape, men against fire. Do you think that the power, is that individual with him? I find it very modern too. Is it individual with him that the landscape's attacking and it's powerful? And also, would you agree that it's very modern that, he, that you can find like Margaret Atwood or Peter Wire, these modern stories um, uh, describing this landscape as attacking you um, somewhat unfairly. As I say, England they had a long time to uh, acclimate by the time of the 19th century. <laughs> Did I make sense? Absolutely. Um, and it's lovely to meet you, Ellen. I, I know you from the Victoria list. Um, so okay. it's lovely to, to put a, a, a face you. to your name. It's a beautiful talk. Um, it's a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's a really interesting observation. Um, Trollope's certainly not the only person to think about the, the landscape attacking or <laughs> causing a sort of onslaught. Um, and I think it comes from lots of different things. I think it's, it's partly just, um, you know, the settler being faced by um, the, the vast expanse. Uh, you, know, you mentioned the, the Canadian context too. And of course, Canada and Australia seem so much bigger if you've come from a tiny place like England. And I could say that a firsthand experience. Um, and so there is a sense in which, um, you know, there's something really daunting about looking at the landscape, um, taking it all in. And, and we see that often in the way that travel writers um, you know, like Dickens and, and travel writers much earlier than Dickens use the sublime to think about the landscape, to try to contain its difference and, and what they can see as its monstrosity. Um, but I like the idea that it's something kind of modern as well. And I think there's a specifically Australian approach to that landscape that comes out of clearance um, and you know, sort of hacking away at trees and plants and having to make space in order to, to graze cattle and, and make your home. Um, and, and I think, you know, again, that sort of comes back to Deborah's question too about nation formation, um, mm -hmm. that this is a nation that has been formed out of sweat and toil um, and, and taming this, this wilderness. And that idea of taming the wilderness becomes such an important trope for colonists, not just in Australia. Um, it licenses their presence there, that if you can say you're taming a landscape, then it's as if you're doing good work. Right, right. I like that. Yes, right. You're doing good work because you're taming it. You're, 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 you're directly fighting with it somehow or other. And this is very heroic. Yes, yes, absolutely. Right. Thank you. As several people have mentioned in the chat, the film that you were thinking of is Picnic at, uh, Picnic at Hanging Rock. So. There's another one that's more about, I'm afraid, the Aborigine. It's about the Aborigine. It says Proposition. I think it's Proposition. Uh, with the guy who was in Henry VIII and and um, Emily, whatever her name is, she's very good. Um, but that too, the landscape is part of what makes the great difficulty, the tremendous difficulty, because it's so hot. Um, and there's a fabulous scene in that film too, where um, the, the house itself is surrounded by fences and the fences are supposed to be like an English picket fence, except they're all <laughs> twisted because they've come from gum trees. And so it really emphasizes that you can try as hard as you like to create an English home away from home, but it's never going to be effective. <laughs> so it's a great example. Thank you. A question from Stephanie, please unmute yourself when you want to speak. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Grace. Um, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so interesting. Um, and for me in Australia, um, I guess, yeah, it really sort of resonates with me. Um, something that I found really fascinating um, that you mentioned is about the representation of fire um, in fiction and, or in literature and how sometimes it might be represented in a humorous way um, or sort of a melodramatic way. And, um, you know, possibly also that being sort of an Australian response that we use humor as a, a coping 
um, mechanism, maybe not just Australian, uh, but certainly um, that's something that, um, you know, feels familiar. And I suppose um, my question really is, um, is that something, you know, that sort of humorous depiction, is that still um, a way that, you know, we're talking about fire when I'm thinking that um, certainly in the last few years, you know, with the, the recent bushfires, there is a lot more focus on how um, psychologically and, you know, physically um, affecting these events can be. And so I'm wondering whether, um, you know, representations are, are now sort of more on that side of, of recognizing that it's, you know, a, a trauma and, you know, are we heading more towards the psychological representation um, and away from that kind of humorous um, minimizing um, depiction? Uh, so I'm not sure if that's, that's a very um, a clear question, but that was just, I, I was really struck by um, that, um, you know, part of, part of your distinction. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, before I answer your question, I just want to say that Stephanie has very recently completed a really brilliant thesis on Dickens and, and villains, um, and I was very privileged to be one of the examiners. So um, it's so nice to see you here, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you um, so much question about um, about humor and the bushfire is a really interesting one and I think um, you, you're right I mean my experience as an outsider living in Australia is that humor is often something that Australian society mobilizes as a means of, of dealing with things that are uncomfortable and that might explain you know why some of the the early thing the early stories um, do engage in a humorous way I think though it's also possibly driven by a lack of knowledge um, and, and, and also, in addition to that, you know, we quite often laugh at things that make us uncomfortable. Um, and so it's a way, it's an early way, I think, of, of containing the fire, of trying to make it manageable. Um, because if you think about a fire um, of that scale, it is kind of unthinkable. It, you know, it's so huge and so overwhelming um, that you have to find some way of coping with it. So it could be a coping mechanism. But I think it's something that really, um, in the works that I've read at least, um, begins to, to sort of um, to drip away from representations as we move into the 1860s and 1870s. The, the melodrama and the humour gives way to something that's a lot more serious. And, and I think what begins to happen is that there have been more fires, that the settlers realise that fire is something that comes back and it'll come back again and again and again. So something that they'd thought of as perhaps a once in a lifetime catastrophe is something that they've got to learn to live with. And that requires a different kind of coping mechanism. And I think that's where national identity and nation building come together um, and, and sort of take away, take over from that. And certainly uh, thinking about recent bushfire stories, 20th and 21st century bushfire stories that I've looked at, um, they tend to be much more interested in the the aftermath of the fire of how you put yourself together after you've experienced the fire and how you live with that anxiety that the fire is going to return right thank you yes a question from mike and please unmute yourself hi um, I wonder if you think there's any kind of fundamental difference between the Anglo-American settler imperialism experience and others. You know, I'm thinking, you know, that America, you know, in North America and Australia, and the other English-speaking settler um, empires, um, taming, the, taming the landscape um, is the primary trope. But if you, you know, the Belgians go into the Congo and you think of Heart of Darkness, the jungle isn't tameable. Um, and they commit genocide against the Congolese. In South Africa, the, the Germans, you know, don't try to tame the land. They commit genocide against the Herrera. I mean, the, the, the jungle, and, and in South America, the same thing for the Spanish-speaking uh, conquerors. Is there something about the Anglo-American experience that's different? 
I wonder if it's just as simple as a one size fits all. Um, and I think the Anglo part is probably the significant part here that, um, you know, the, the British went out into the world and they used similar techniques over and over and over again. And so um, one of the really um, the heartbreaking things, um, if you read Stephen Pine's most recent book, um, The Piracine, um, he talks about the, um, the need to relearn indigenous firefighting techniques or fire management te techniques and, and how to live with fire. Um, and it's because, you know, in America, as in Australia, um, and as in so many other places of, in the world, um, that indigenous knowledge was ignored um, or, or you know, almost effaced by the, the British and their behavior. And so I think it's just this, this British legacy of, of, of taming a wilderness, um, of, of shaping it. Um, and we can see that in the way um, that the British landscapes themselves work. Um, you know, as somebody who grew up thinking that a field full of sheep was nature, um, I can say, that you know that that enclosure um, is something that that um, I think historically um, the British have been prone to. We have a question from. Did you want to follow up, Mike? No. We have have a, a a question or a, a comment that I think is a question in the chat that has to do with gender in relation to um, to to the fire fiction to fire mm -hmm. fire narratives. And the comment is that firefighting is uh, sometimes presented as a macho experience, a heavily masculine uh, experience, and that the heroism of firefighting is, is a male experience, but that the, the threat of fire can be feminizing, that fire itself can be gendered. I'm extrapolating a little bit from the comment. And uh, you had mentioned earlier that there is a kind of class reconciliation that is sometimes provided by fire through the marriage plot. That is that the haughty heroine uh, and the, 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 the rough settler uh, overcome their differences through the marriage plot. But I, I wonder if there are other ways in which gender factors into the tropes of fire fiction. Yes, absolutely. I love the idea of fire being emasculating. And uh, that's certainly something that I want to hang on to and bring into our discussion of Harry Heathcote in the next couple of sessions. Um, but I think um, a really great example is in um, Henry Lawson's short story, The Drover's Wife. Um, the Drover's Wife is, um, Lawson was an Australian um, born writer, um, and The Drover's wife, wife is a story about a woman who has to sort of face all of these problems that the bush throws at her um, while her husband is away. You know, he's out on the land um, droving cattle, and, and she's at home, and so, you know, she has to, to kill snakes, and she has to fight a bushfire. Um, and interestingly, I think if I'm remembering the story correctly, she, she actually puts trousers on when she goes to fight the fire, um, and of course, when the men come back, she then has to step away and the usual gender order is restored. Um, but it says something really interesting about, um, you know, the, the way that fire is, is conceived as something that should be fought by men, um, that, men can, that women can fight it uh, in extremity, but they must yield their place immediately when the man comes back. Um, but it also tells us things about the way that women had to, to cope alone in the bush, um, that women did, you know, if you were on a sheep station um, or if you were um, sort of living in um, a shack in the wilderness, you would spend a lot of time by yourself as your husband did itinerant work. Um, and so that's, um, that's a real, it's a real difficulty that many settler women had to face. Another aspect of, of class difference that um, I'm curious about has to do with the distinction between voluntary settlers, immigrants, and those who are compelled. Uh, yes. Convicts. And that's, uh, I know in some Australian fiction is an important class distinction. Uh, does that come up as an issue in fire narratives? Um, it can do sometimes, um, and sometimes in, in surprising ways. Sometimes convicts are actually quite helpful for fighting the fires. Um, and sometimes 
convicts are responsible for, for setting the fires. So in the story that I mentioned really briefly by J.S. Burlace, um, 12 Miles Broad, it's a convict who comes out of the bush. Um, and I think he, he wants to be invited for a meal and um, the family say, no, we don't want you to come for a meal. We've no idea who you are. Um, and so he just, he, he says that he's going to cause them huge problems because of that. And he sets a fire. Um, and so the convict arsonist, I think, was, was more of a fictional trope than a reality. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly spoke to anxieties about the presence of convicts um, in Australian society and the ways in which um, the convict could just appear suddenly. Um, again and again and again in, in Australian fiction, you see the figure who emerges from the bush. And sometimes that figure is a convict, sometimes that figure is an indigenous Australian, but it speaks to the anxieties um, that are kind of haunting Australian writing. Other questions? Yes, Ellen, you have another question. Yeah, to speak again, two things that in California, I wrote that convicts are both pressured into and paid very little for fighting fire. And if you get real reports about the way in which they've fought some of these raging fires, they have taken advantage of some of these convicts. I have read that Lawson story a long time ago. And one of the things that struck about me was how alone she was and how frightened she was to be alone and how hard it is to live in a house where nobody else is around. You know, you can't just go down the street and get a milk. And, and uh, that was a, a, a real factor, I suppose, in the woman's experience of colonialism. There's what's her name, Susanna Moody, you know, that one, the classic. She's there in the bush and she's there in that house all alone. And it's, it's, uh, that's an aspect that's a gender difference between uh, men and women. Uh, just back to convicts who are often taken very bad advantage of in these business of fires. Absolutely, and that persisted into the 20th century. Um, there are um, Californian, yeah, well, yes, um, there are Californian fire stories from the, the 1940s and 50s, um, and you see convicts being pressed into going to fight really major fires. So it's, it's something that, as you say, continues to be um, a reality. Carolyn had a question. Ah, yes. You'll need to unmute yourself. Unmute. I'm just astounded by the character and the strength of people living in such remarkably inhospitable places. And, you know, like where you live somewhere and you have a tree to look at and, and the, the theory is get rid of the trees. And um, so psychologically it, it's you know there's so much emphasis now on the psychological component of post-traumatic stress um and i just i'm amazed by how people are survived also i'm just wondering if um you know you were subjected to a lot of flooding has that impacted you know it's either fire is going to get us or floods um and, and this is just a personal thing, but I know having gone through an earthquake and having had a house <clears throat> tumble down upon us, um, no matter how well I ever think I'm doing, when I get stressed, first thing in my mind, earthquake, you know, it's my PTSD return to, to, to stress. So, so how do people, I guess they cope because they cope, right? I think that's right, they had to. Um, but I think what's what's fascinating is to look at a lot of those stories and we can see characters who absolutely do have post-traumatic stress disorder. They don't have the vocabulary to be able mm -hmm. to articulate it in the ways that we do, but it's there. Um, and you can see it in some of the decisions that they make, you can see it in their psychology, and you can see it in their anxieties. Um, it's one of the reasons I find Harry Hethbert such an interesting story, because um, his psychology is so fascinating. Um, he is such an incredibly anxious character, um, and he hasn't actually experienced a fire yet, <laughs> he's just kind of waiting for it to happen. <laughs> But the fact that he's an orphan, I think, is, you know, that is the trauma that triggers this anxiety that he's offloading onto the environment. Um, and I think, you know, there is that, so you, you asked, how do these people live? And I think they, they just have to. Um, 
for many people, for many Victorian settlers, um, you know, they didn't have the option of turning around and going home. Mm -hmm. If you traveled on an assisted immigration scheme, um, you'd have to do very, very well at whatever you chose to do when you landed to be able to scrape together the fare to go back again. And so for mm -hmm. many people, um, it was just a case of arriving in Australia and settling there. And, and Trollope really disapproved of people who took the money and ran. Um, he really has a lot of disdain for um, gold rush people in particular, um, who kind of came into Australia, um, extracted gold and then left and took it back to England. Um, he, he didn't like that at all. But that's drifting away from the question you asked. Mm, very good. Wonderful presentation. Well, thank you. Have we other questions for Grace? Yes, Deborah. Unmute. Sorry. Um, I, something, um, one of the things that's haunted me about your talk, there are many things that are, that are haunting me and haunting sort of the landscape of my mind, is the ring trees. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about this sort of particular cruelty of that and the way the trees we can almost feel that sort of slow, painful dying. And what I wonder is if um, you've made any connections with that, with Trollope's disquiet about the ringing of the trees and the sort of agony of their dying. And with, this may seem very odd, but with Thomas Hardy, who seems to me, you know, of, of the English novelist, who wrote, I mean, later, but not a lot. I mean, he was writing at the same time, obviously, but also later, um, you know, who seems to sort of feel the agony of what was actually being done to trees at, at the time. And I know there's some people who've done some work on this and, um, you know, but the horrible sort of stripping of trees and the um, you know, some of it having to do with the wood that was being, was needed for the Imperial native, for the Imperial Navy and, you know, the, the plantations that he's always referring to in fictions like Far From the Madding Crowd and others, which I had to explain to my students, were actually plantations of trees that were planted because, you know, I live in Virginia. There's only one kind of plantation for students here that's part of the history here, right? Um, so, and I, I'm just wondering if those are kind of connections which might become or already are important to you with two such disparate writers um, in so many ways, you know, actually having this sort of common image which of the natural world and sort of the suffering of the tree as part of the, the landscape. Yeah. That's really lovely. Um, I like that a lot. It's not a connection that I've made and I'm going to have to think about it. Um, I've Trollope was thinking about other things when he was thinking about the suffering of the tree um and but i think he was he was mostly thinking about the suffering of the people and this is hard to get right because trollope's writing sort of vacillates between um a lot of you know highly unpalatable comments about race um and about um the the indigenous people he encounters from a distance during his time in australia and a growing sense of guilt um, and a growing awareness that um, these people have not been well treated by the settler society. And, and that's a huge understatement. I don't want to try to downplay that. Um, and so it's something he keeps returning to again and again in his writing. Um, and so when he's thinking about a tree, he's definitely thinking about the way the tree is suffering. But I think he's also thinking about the pain of human suffering. Um, and so that's why that image um, that Dickens also uses of the army of skeletons, the trees as skeletons, is such a striking one because he's clearly thinking about the corpses of trees. Um, he's not just thinking about trees as, as commodities to be turned into ships or furniture or whatever, um, or to be moved because they're inconvenient. He's thinking about something that is living and that is dying. Thank you, Grace. That was wonderful response. Grace, would you say anything more about arson plots? I, 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 you, you mentioned that in relation to uh, 
the contrast between the custodial approach of indigenous Australians and uh, the colonial uh, approach to uh, fire management or the use of fire. But how does arson figure into the, the plots of fire narratives? Um, it's, it's something that surfaces repeatedly and I think it comes up repeatedly for different reasons. Um, and so there's a story that I, I didn't have time to talk about um, by uh, Mary Fortune, who's an Australian writer um, who wrote as, as Waif Wanderer. Um, and sh this, this story involves Rick burning um, and it's a sort of vengeful hay Rick burning. And I was talking about this um, this story a couple of years ago, and somebody in the audience said, well, actually, what you're talking about is the way that people have brought political burning um, into the new world, that they've come to Australia with this tradition of, of burning things down um, because they're discontented, and they've brought this to Australia where it's, of course, much more dangerous because the land is so dry. And I think that's a really striking idea. Um, there are arsonists in stories for lots of different reasons. Um, as, as you mentioned, there are the indigenous um, arsonists who are usually not arsonists at all. They're, they're just managing the land. Um, there are convict arsonists um, and those reflect, um, you know, I, I don't know the figures. I don't know how many Australian convicts actually did go out in real life and set fire to things, but I suspect there are probably more in stories than there were in reality. Um, and then there are the accidental fires. Um, so the Australian novelist and botanist um, and illustrator Louisa Atkinson was really interested in carelessness in the bush, people who set fires by accident by not putting out their campfires and by not understanding bush ecology, um, by not realizing that you can't behave the same way in the Australian bush as you can in a forest in England. Um, so I think fire setting takes lots of different um, appearances in this kind of writing, uh, but it is a massive concern, um, you know, culturally as well as fictionally, um, because of the in, in immense amount of damage it can do. And um, I know that um, a large number of bushfires are human set. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're acts of arson. Um, they can be human set by accident um, and they can be controlled fires that then become not controlled fires, um, but there is a sense in which human agency has an important role, a significant role to play in fire setting. Mm -hmm. the, the connection to political uh, acts of arson, Rick Burning in particular, uh, is I think very interesting. Uh, many of those who were transported to uh, Australia were Chartists and, and the, uh, the Chartist tradition is a strong political one in which acts of arson were uh, often attributed, sometimes wrongly, to, uh, to Chartists. So uh, that, th thank you for that. That's, that's, that's helpful. That's great. Thank you, John. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that, that people have? We're approaching soon the, the end of the time for today. I, I don't know, Grace, if you want to give us any, uh, any tips toward Harry Heathcote that uh, we should, things that we should think about, or we have two sessions, one in February and one in March to talk about that text. And uh, how should we divide our time or how, how would you like us to divide our reading in preparation for those meetings? Um, thank you, John. Thanks for reminding me that I needed to mention that. So on the, the website, I think we've said that we'll discuss the story in, in two halves. But I think realistically, um, people are going to want to read ahead. So um, I'm going to talk to everybody at the beginning of the next session to gauge where you are with your reading. Um, but I think my sense is that if you would like to finish the book, then you absolutely should. What I'll try to do to provide some continuity between the sessions is um, I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, the environmentalism in Harry Hithcock when we, we talk about it. Um, and maybe we can frame um, our first discussion around the environment. Um, and then we can see where that leads us in terms of the, the following session. Um, 
And so please bring anything at all that you notice about that text to the discussion. I don't want to prescribe the direction our conversation takes. One of the exciting things for me is to hear from all of you about what you find interesting about the text. I'll begin with um, a brief presentation about the book um, and some of the things that I find interesting about it, but I am most interested to hear from all of you. Um, and I guess the other thing I want to say is about the tone. And um, this is advice that I've stolen from the great Dickens scholar, Jenny Hartley, which is that if you're struggling with the melodramatic tone, try reading it aloud. Um, this is something I say to my students um, that, you know, we're so distant from melodrama that it can seem a little bit cheesy when we read it on the page. But if you start to proclaim it, it works very, very differently. So um, I like to think of people across the United States reading Harry Hepgood aloud to themselves. Uh, if you are struggling with Trollope's tone, I think that's a, a coping strategy. Very good. Well, it has been a wonderful two hours. Thank you very much, Grace. We will Thank see you. you. Me. We will see you next month. Uh, please join me in expressing appreciation to Grace for her presentation today. Wonderful. Thank you. That was fabulous. fabulous. Terrific. Thank you so All right. We'll see you next month. Thank you so much, Courtney. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, everyone.